Okay, this is continuing the discussion of chem chemical equilibrium. Last time we looked at the Haber process and uh, did a specific example, uh, but this time we're going to talk about uh, some more specific examples, but uh, some different ones and also some, some sort of general relations. Okay, so if this is our chemical reaction, uh, A moles of component A plus B moles of component B uh, goes to C moles of component D and D moles of component D, remember that we can look up in thermodynamic tables, the heats and, enthal and entropies of formation of these species and obtain a Gibbs free energy uh, associated with this chemical reaction. And uh, that identifies for us the equilibrium constant. The equilibrium constant, as we noted last time, is formally uh, dimensionless because it is entirely composed of a ratio of activities uh, to their stoichiometric coefficients. Uh, it's convenient to make a couple of new definitions, things that we didn't talk about last time. Uh, when we have a reaction involving uh, A plus B species on the left and C plus D species on the right, if all of those are gas phase species, it's uh, quite convenient to define a property delta, which is C plus D minus A, A minus B. Uh, this is the change in the number of moles of gas molecules that you have as each mole of the reaction uh, proceeds. Uh, so we also define here a reference pressure of one atmosphere. And last time we, we uh, kept encountering this, this ratio of fugacity coefficients to the power of the stoichiometric coefficients. And it's convenient to go ahead and also define that as a quantity K phi. Okay, so this is not a actual equilibrium constant. It's just a, just a convenient definition uh, for, for computing equilibrium constants of other types. Okay, so recall that last time when we considered the Haber process, uh, we computed the mole fraction of ammonia at equilibrium. And the way we did that was to go through and write down this, uh, this um, ratio of activity coefficients, that is the equilibrium, the true equilibrium constant, in terms of fugacity coefficients, mole fractions, and total pressures using the lewis randall rule. Okay, so... Uh, so what we're going to do this time is to note that quite often you'll find equilibrium constants reported with units. For example, uh, with units of pressure, if you're talking about ratios of pressures raised to the, equal, to the stoichiometric coefficients, or uh, with units of concentration, if you're talking about concentrations raised to the stoichiometric coefficients, or they can be dimensionless, but uh, sometimes those actually are not the true equilibrium constant. They are the ratio of uh, mole fractions. And so you always want to be careful to make sure that you know what kind of equilibrium constant you're dealing with and to know its relation to the real, uh, the real equilibrium constant, which is the one that you can get from thermodynamic values. Okay, so, uh, so the way you do that uh, is you go back to this expression. You write all those activities in terms of, uh, for example, a fugacity coefficient times a mole fraction times a pressure if it's a gas phase reaction. And then you can go through and you can solve for the quantity that you want. Okay, so if we want the uh, ratio of partial pressures, then we would take those mole fractions within an ideal gas approximation. We have that the uh, Xi times the total concentration is the, the, the concentration of species I. Then we can multiply the total concentration as P over RT, and we find that we can always go back and then and express that Xi times P is a partial pressure. Uh, so, so this is how we can interconvert between different forms. We can get this thing in terms of concentrations. We can get it in terms of partial pressures, the P times the Xi. Uh, or we can just solve for the ratio of the mole fractions. So I've done that algebra here. Uh, it's actually not so difficult, and, and it's very convenient to write down the results if you have made this definition for the number of uh, molecules changing as you... Um, as you do a, a one time through the reaction. Okay, so the, the equilibrium ratio of pressures to their stoichiometric coefficients is the true equilibrium constant times this object K phi uh, to, the minus, to the minus one uh, times the uh, reference pressure to the power delta. Okay, the equilibrium ratio of concentrations to the stoichiometric coefficients is the true equilibrium constant. Here's K phi to the minus one again the atmospheric pressure, reference pressure, to the power delta. And then you have this factor RT to the power minus delta. So where is that coming from? That's coming from expressing the, the concentration, 
things in terms of concentration instead of pressure. So remember that when you do that, you introduce, at least within an ideal gas approximation, this P over RT term. Uh, so then the, the one that we did last time when we looked at the Haber process was to write things in terms of Kx, and uh, that's given by the equilibrium constant, true equilibrium constant again, multiplied by K phi to the minus 1, and then this dimensionless quantity P divided by the reference pressure, all to the power of minus delta. Okay, so this is a, um, I will put that back up here, and if you want to press pause uh, and, and use those, uh, go ahead. Um, but, but these are general results for interconverting equilibrium constants of different kinds for the gas phase, right? So in the equilibrium, sorry, in the, in the solution phase, in aqueous solution, all of this would change, and we would have, for example, instead of fugacity coefficients, we would have activity coefficients, and probably it wouldn't make any sense to talk about pressures in the aqueous phase. Everything is basically incompressible there. But still, you can use these concentration forms uh, if you get rid of this RT to the minus delta. OK, <clears throat> let's do an example. Uh, again, looking at a gas phase reaction, we have nitrogen tetroxide reversibly decomposing into NO2. Uh, and I want to, I want to make a, a note here, a special note, to, to say that in thermodynamics, reversible means done infinitely slowly passing through a manifold of equilibrium states. Uh, in kinetics, reversible has a very different meaning. It means that the equilibrium for the reaction that you're looking at lies somewhere in the middle, neither completely to the right nor completely to the left. Okay, so, so we use these two terms. Uh, we use both of these two terms in this class. Uh, but, but keep in mind the context uh, that when we talk about a reversible reaction, we don't mean a reaction that happens infinitesimally slow. We mean a reaction that happens uh, without proceeding to completion. Okay? So, uh, so, um, so the equilibrium constant for this, for this reaction, this is a dissociation reaction, uh, is Kc times, is Kc is equal to 0 0.1 molar, at 340 Kelvin. Notice this is an equilibrium constant with units. Uh, it is actually a ratio of equilibrium concentrations to the power of the stoichiometric coefficients and not an actual ratio of activities. So the first thing we want to do is to set up a table and uh, so that we can compute our equilibrium conversion when we have a constant volume batch reactor. Okay, so we're going to suppose that our feed is pure nitrogen tetroxide at two atmospheres. So uh, so we have N2O4 starts out, we have N0 moles. After the reaction occurs one, one time, we've lost one mole. After it occurs uh, xi times, we've lost xi moles. And we've created two xi moles of NO2, right, starting from zero. So the net number of, of molecules that uh, we have at that point is N0 plus xi. Now we can plug all of that in. When we have a constant volume reactor, uh, how much uh, NO2 do we have? We just have 2 xi divided by volume. That quantity then is the concentration of uh, the, the product. We're going to square that, and we're going to divide it by the concentration of our reactants. That's N0 minus xi divided by V, and that's equal to 0 0.1 molar. Okay, so, so now we have, again, the situation where we really only have one variable in this problem if V and N0 have been specified, and that is to now go through and solve for the extent of reaction at equilibrium. Okay, if V and N0 aren't known yet, though, we can still make some progress on this problem. We can write everything in terms of what's called a fractional conversion. That is the uh, amount of product you've made relative to uh, the amount of reactants that you started with. Okay, so uh, effectively the, the amount, the fraction of your your reactants that have been converted into products, I should say, uh, a little more precisely, because the stoichiometric coefficient on our reactants is not always one. It is in this case, but uh, we have to be careful with that. Uh, okay. So the concentration of reactants initially is N0 divided by V, and the nice thing about this convention is that N0 and V have effectively completely been replaced by a single variable, Ca0, uh, so we have our initial concentration of reactants is Ca0. After uh, reaching equilibrium conversion, we have Ca0 times 1 minus x. That's the fraction that remain. And uh, the amount of products that we've made 
is 2 times CA0 times that fractional conversion. So now we can rewrite these expressions, and things look a little simpler. So it's 2 CA0 times x. This is the, the concentration of products. We're going to square that, divide by the concentration of reactants, which now can be written also in terms of this equilibrium uh, conversion. And we have left just to solve for x at equilibrium, and the quadratic equation comes into play here, and we have 1 8 of minus 1. This ratio of the equilibrium uh, ratio of concentrations divided by the initial concentration is uh, the one parameter that we still need to specify. Uh, but you can write everything in terms of that. And, and so if we know the initial concentration, uh, which is given here in terms of the, the quantities that we had, right? So we had that the start out with, we started out with two atmospheres, uh, and we had 340 Kelvin. Everything else is a matter of plugging in gas constants and stuff. And what you get is uh, that the concentration initially is 0 0.07 molar. And at, uh, at this value of this initial parameter, uh, we find that our equilibrium conversion is 44%. Okay, so what if we were to do this same reaction in a flow reactor where the where effectively the pressure is constant and the gas is allowed to expand as it as it can as it decomposes so let's suppose again that we have a feed gas that's nitrogen tetroxide at two atmospheres and in a flow reactor our gas is going to expand we have to account for that we have a number of moles per second flowing in uh, after they reach equilibrium in a long, long flow reactor, they might reach equilibrium at least, and they will flow out. The amount of gas remaining is 1 minus equilibrium conversion times uh, that initial amount of gas flowing in. The amount of NO2 flowing out is 2 times Fa0 times equilibrium conversion amount. Uh, when I add everything up, I get that the, the total amount of stuff flowing in is just Fa0, and the total of stuff flowing out is Fa0 times 1 plus the equilibrium conversion. Okay, so this factor here is going to help us account for the, uh, for the new volumetric flow rate, right? So we started out with some inlet volumetric flow rate, and when the gases leave, they're going to be uh, expanded and therefore flowing faster by, a, by, a, by an amount, one, by a factor of 1 plus this equilibrium conversion. Okay, so our concentration of species A at equilibrium is the amount of uh, A flowing in uh, times, the, times this correction to give us the amount of A flowing out is 1 minus XA equilibrium divided by the volumetric flow rate of stuff flowing out and that is the, amount, the volumetric flow rate coming in times a correction to give us the total amount of volume flowing out which is this 1 plus XEQ and and so, uh, so this, then, we can use the same kind of setup to, to write an expression for the concentration of B leaving the reactor at equilibrium. And that is just the amount of B leaving in moles per second divided by that volumetric flow rate uh, of the total gas leaving the reactor. When we plug all this in, our equilibrium constant, again, is the concentration of the product B squared divided by the concentration of A. And writing all of that in terms of our equilibrium conversions, our inlet vol volumetric flow rates, and our inlet flow rates of our reactant uh, gives us this equation. Notice that the volumetric flow rates here uh, have completely, this, these initial factors of the volumetric flow rates have vanished. We can write everything in terms of the inlet concentration again, and, uh, and that is just equal to this known number, 0 0.1 molar, right? So this is has nothing to do with whether the whether this number here has nothing to do with whether the gases are in a closed reactor or if they're flowing. Uh, all of that is taken into account in the way we compute the concentrations. Okay, so uh, so we have again a quadratic equation and we can solve that to get the equilibrium conversion and we find that the equilibrium conversion is 0.51 percent. Okay, not surprising again. This number, 0.51 percent, is slightly larger than the number that we got when we did this reaction in a closed reactor, 44%, right? The reason is that we have a reaction that's converting uh, one mole of nitrogen tetroxide into two moles of nitrogen dioxide, and there's an expansion, there's a natural expansion that wants to occur at constant pressure. When you allow that expansion to occur, the reaction can go farther to the right. 
when you constrain this gas to remain in the same constant volume, it prevents it from going as far, and, uh, and basically the con overall concentrations are going up, and that's helping drive the reaction back uh, at an earlier stage than it would happen if you allowed them to expand. Okay, so we can go on and we can talk about multi-reaction equilibria, uh, but I think I will go ahead and stop here and save that for the next one.